At Apple, we believe privacy, 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 privacy. Okay, so you've all heard Apple talk about privacy a lot, and also about how eco-friendly they are. But is that all true, or is there some sort of underlying corporate reason behind all of this? Do the benefits that Apple is giving us with all the privacy tools outweigh the negatives? And what are the negatives, really? Is Apple evil? The short answer is, of course not. We're not living in some sort of dystopian future here with evil corporations that just want to take your money. But there are a few things that uh, will make you pause and contemplate for a second. So get us snacks ready and enjoy a bit of a different video. Okay, so probably the biggest statement that Apple has started making in the past few years is that they are trying to become the world's most eco-friendly company. Which is great. Obviously, this is a positive thing. And they have done a few things to make this happen. For example, their offices and data centers run on 100% renewable energy. Their products are highly recyclable, and they're also reducing waste by making the boxes of the iPhone smaller by not including a charger. All of these statements are true, and on the surface, you might think that Apple is indeed very environmentally focused. But once you dig deeper, you'll realize that each of these points has a major downside, which almost, just almost, invalidates the entire point. For example, even though Apple's offices and stores do run on 100% renewable energy, their manufacturing partners, who make all the iPhones and all the Macs and so on, uh, do not. So with every Apple device that Apple makes, there is still an environmental impact. They do claim that they want to be fully carbon neutral by 2030, which will include their suppliers as well. So I am happy that they are acknowledging this issue and working towards it. But as of right now, keep in mind that their manufacturing is not eco-friendly. But yeah, that statement is true. Now let's take a look at the second one. The fact that Apple's products are highly recyclable. So if your iPhone breaks, you will take it to the Apple Store. And depending on the damage, if your iPhone is no longer in warranty, which by the way only lasts for a single year, you will be charged up to $600 to fix an iPhone 11 Pro Max, for example. The problem is that you can actually buy a newly refurbished iPhone 11 Pro Max for $719. Apple charges almost that price just to fix your broken one, which is absolutely nuts. And because of this, most people just don't end up fixing their broken phones, as it would cost them pretty much the same as buying a new phone. So they just buy a new phone in that case, which in itself creates waste. But why don't they just go to a third-party repair shop then? Well, they can, but Apple has severely restricted what third-party repair shops can do. Louis Rossman and iFixit are both probably the biggest advocates for the right to repair, which simply states that if someone wants to repair a device, they should be able to, and they should have access to the right components to do that. Whereas right now, you have to ask Apple in order to become an authorized repair shop, and even then, there's actually not much that you can do aside from just replacing the screen and the battery. So Apple is still limiting third-party repair shops heavily. Which means that even though Apple claims that they can easily repair your iPhone, oftentimes customers are charged hundreds of dollars just to fix a broken charging port, which independent repair shops can do for something like $30 to $50. But a lot of them are unable to do so, as Apple just doesn't make the components readily available. So let's go back to that statement. Apple products highly recyclable. Is that true? Uh, yes, it is. But Apple's decision to make repairs almost inaccessible to customers by charging them exorbitant prices and restricting third parties from repairing creates a ton of waste, which, in my opinion, it just invalidates Apple's entire point. So now let's take a look at Apple's third point, that the lack of chargers and iPhone boxes reduces waste. Again, if you just take this as it is, it makes sense. Not including a charger in the box of iPhones means that the box itself will be smaller, which in turn means that more boxes will fit in a delivery truck, which in turn means that Apple will need less trucks to ship the same number of iPhones, which in turn means less pollution. So problem solved, right? Not really. You see, the real issue here is that by Apple removing the charger, 
people who don't already have a USB Type-C charger will need to buy one separately. And considering that Apple only started shipping USB-C chargers with the iPhone 11, unless you're upgrading from the iPhone 11 to the 12, you will actually need a charger. And some of you might say now that, oh, I have an old iPhone 5 charger, which is still lightning, so I can actually use that, which is true, but that will be a very slow charger. So if you want a fast charger, you will have to buy a separate USB Type-C one. But then if you buy a separate charger, that charger will have its own box. That box will likely go inside another larger box, like, you know, Amazon boxes, which will go inside its own delivery truck, which will require extra shipping and therefore create extra pollution. So do you see where I'm coming from? By Apple removing the charger, they actually end up polluting the environment more. What they should have done instead is give the users the option at checkout to claim a free charger that would be included in the box of the iPhone should they need one. At the moment, the only thing that Apple has achieved by removing the charger is saving money in manufacturing and shipping costs and shifting the environmental problem from themselves to the consumer. The big issue here is that Apple doesn't think about others when making these statements. They analyze everything as if no other company exists. And with this mentality, uh, sure, Apple is saving the planet, but in reality, that is not entirely true. Now, probably Apple's biggest campaign right now is about privacy, about how unlike other companies such as Facebook and Google, Apple does truly care about keeping your data safe. So is this true? Um, yes. Apple does in fact keep pretty much all data used for processing your photos and even processing your Siri requests directly on your devices rather than on Apple's servers. Everything is encrypted and therefore it means that not even Apple can read your personal data. For example, they recently introduced Private Relay, which does prevent you from being tracked, but it also severely caps your internet speeds and it doesn't offer you a lot of the benefits of, you know, an actual VPN, such as the ability to manually change your location and so much more. Speaking of VPNs, massive shout out to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. Surfshark is a tool that secures your internet connection so that everything you do online stays private while also allowing you to browse the web from a different country and access services such as Netflix US from outside the US. But Surfshark is also a different type of VPN. With most VPNs, once you activate them, your internet speeds would be severely impacted, but not with Surfshark. Surfshark can also block ads as well as malware with their clean web feature and automatically alert you when your personal details, such as emails, passwords, credit cards, and more, have been leaked online. Another exclusive feature to Surfshark is Surfshark Search, which gives you real and organic web search results with zero ads and zero tracking. And at just 1.56 pounds a month and three months for free by using the coupon code Zenoptech, Surfshark is about half the price of what other VPNs cost. Check it out using the link below. Okay, going back to the whole Apple privacy policy, whilst it does seem good on paper, there are a few downsides to this too. You see, simply by Apple not keeping as much of your data as the competition, a lot of their services are actually lacking in features compared to that competition. We all know how Siri is far behind the Google Assistant when it comes to not just regular answers uh, and, and features, but also contextual awareness. Apple Photos is also severely limited compared to Google Photos, in which you can pretty much search for anything, like anything, and instantly get the right answer. Apple Maps, even though it did get much better over the years. It still severely lacks behind Google Maps when it comes to overall map data and traffic info. Apple's autocorrect predictions are severely lacking behind Google's and they don't support the seamless switching between languages that Google does. Not only that, but when you switch to a new device, that new device would not remember any of the auto prediction or autocorrect or anything like that from the previous device as everything is stored locally rather than on the cloud. Apple's privacy policy is actually affecting the functionality of their apps. And look, I do think that what Apple's doing with privacy is great. Like, I do like how they've started a fight with Facebook, who literally don't care at all about your data or your privacy. So I am definitely a fan of what Apple is doing and respect what they are doing with privacy, but I just think that they should give that privacy control in the hands of the users 
rather than Apple making the choices for us. Because I for one would want for Siri to be smarter or for Apple Photos to just work better. So we were thinking about this and how we could make privacy work better and give users more choice. And this is what we came up with. Instead of you having to go into settings, then privacy, and then go into location or camera, and only then see which apps have access to those, we made it so that you have a privacy menu for each app, which tells you exactly what the app can or cannot access. We also made it super clear what extra features you would get or lose depending on the permissions that you give the app. This is something that neither Apple nor the app developer tells you about at the moment. On top of this, we also added this privacy meter at the top, which tells you exactly how private an app is, depending on how much data you share with it. For example, in Siri, you could disable everything to keep it from accessing any of your data. But if you enable the microphone, it will be immediately clear that you would of course get voice feedback. If you enable photos, Siri will give you more personalized results. Same for a location, which if you enable, Siri will be able to deliver nearby suggestions and more contextual awareness and responses, which is something that has been severely lacking when compared to the Google Assistant. And Maps would work in a similar way, where if you enabled contacts, you would be able to see saved contact locations on the map, and if you enable search history, maps will get smarter as it will be able to show you your most searched restaurants, for example, directly on the map. Our idea behind this is that you should be able to make an app smarter by manually enabling these toggles and sharing more data with that app. And the most important part here is that you can easily see what data you're sharing as well as what you are getting in return. Like at the moment, if a game requests access to your camera, you have no idea why that is and what you get in return for that. Which is what I think is a huge problem and something that needs to be fixed ASAP. But you let me know what do you guys think about all of this and by the way, if you have enjoyed our quick animation and uh, this improved privacy window that we created, definitely subscribe uh, for more interesting tech videos like this one, hopefully is. As you know, it's uh, free, subscribe, and um, why not? So, thanks. And the final thing that I want to address is that Apple has way more control over their users than you might think. Sure, their ecosystem is the best one on the market, and once you're in it, you'll absolutely love it. But the problem here is that if there is one product from that ecosystem that you don't like, you won't be able to replace it with something different. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you're an avid Apple user. You have a Mac, an iPhone, an iPad, an Apple Watch, AirPods, and a HomePod. And you're very satisfied with every single one of them except for the HomePod. And that's because you live in a large home and you need something more powerful and bigger, which Apple does not offer with a HomePod. Well, in that case, you're out of luck because unless you buy Apple's HomePod, you don't really have any other options. I mean, sure, you can get a smart speaker and if you have one with Google Assistant, you can now link Apple Music to it. So problem solved, right? Um, well, not really because you won't be able to integrate it with your iPhone at all. In fact, you won't even be able to cast music to it from your iPhone, even though they both support Apple Music. Another example is the MacBook Pro. Some of you might remember the many issues that I was having with my 2018 15 inch MacBook Pro, from everyday crashes to the CPU running at an extremely low clock speed of even 800 megahertz, which made any task basically impossible to do. I would have gladly switched to a different brand of laptops should I not have preferred to use macOS over Windows. And even with my upcoming MacBooks, I was still having crashes because of that T2 chip until Apple finally released the M1 Max, which fixed those issues as the T2 chip was no longer there. So for three years, I was stuck with faulty machines, which because of our Thunderbolt heavy workflow, uh, were crashing daily. Same goes for everyone who bought a MacBook with that butterfly keyboard, which was not only awful to type on, but also kept breaking for a lot of users. And for those users who just wanted a MacBook Pro and macOS and didn't like the awful keyboard at all, well, they had no other choices until Apple finally ditched that faulty keyboard in 2019, four years after its debut. And I could go on and on about how severe Apple's control really is. In the most recent years, Apple has started being more willing to give away some of that control by enabling Apple Music and Apple TV on other devices, or even FaceTime on Android. But have you noticed that 
Apple TV and FaceTime are just web apps. And especially with FaceTime, it doesn't even have most of the features that we have, you know, on actual FaceTime on iOS and macOS. Uh, even though Apple could have easily released a dedicated FaceTime app for Android, they decided not to. The leaked core documents do show Apple's mentality behind all of this, that they want ultimate control because it's their products and they believe they know best. And I do get that. I just feel like if Android users wanted to use AirPods, uh, they should be able to do so. Like some of you will probably say that, oh, you actually can, you just pair them via Bluetooth and they will work, which is true. But the thing is, if you actually try them for yourself, you're going to immediately notice that the volume on all the AirPods is going to be capped at something like 40% and you cannot increase it no matter what you do. So uh, they're pretty much unusable because of that, like the volume is super low. And again, it doesn't really matter what AirPods or what Android phone you have. This is Apple's illusion of choice. Uh, same thing applies to the Mac where you can indeed install apps outside of the App Store, unlike on iOS, but doing so will result in you having to allow multiple privacy settings and sometimes even disable restrictions through a terminal just to get those apps up and running. And some of those apps are actually from Google, so they're not, you know, random weird apps. And Apple's control extends even to us. I've mentioned before that we don't get any early review units from Apple. For example, we posted our iMac unboxing video on May the 25th, an entire week after reviewers who got their hands on early units. And not only that, but the ones who did get review units actually got them at least a week before the video went live, meaning that they had an entire week to make that video and publish it and polish it, uh, whereas we had to make our video as soon as we got it, so basically in one day, otherwise the interest in our video would have fallen even more than it already has. So in reality, we are two weeks behind others when it comes to Apple releases, just because Apple decided not to send us any units, which for an Apple-focused channel like we are, it is affecting us a lot. Oh, and the same applies to Unbox Therapy, Linus Tech Tips, Everything Apple Pro, Max Tech, and many others who are severely affected by Apple's decision to not have any relationship with them for no apparent reason. Again, another example of how controlling Apple can truly be. So in the end, is Apple evil? Well, no, I honestly don't think they are. I think they're doing their best, they're trying to improve, but I think they should be more open, more open to giving away some of that control and giving the users more options when it comes to repairs, when it comes to privacy, and also when it comes to just using their devices in general. The moral of this whole story is if a company tells you something, don't just believe it as it is. But at the same time, also don't just immediately disprove it. Do your own research and make your own informed decision whether or not that company is indeed telling you the truth and whether or not they have any hidden financial motives behind. Always question, never stop. Let me know in the comments. What do you guys think about all of this? And definitely subscribe if you have enjoyed this bit of a different video. Thanks for watching, I'm Daniel, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Sign up tech, signing out. Cheers.